Hey everyone, we're here, EXO Live. Uh, welcome back. We are going to have a great conversation today. Uh, we've got a special guest in the studio. We are live at the EXO Marriage Center here in South Lake, Texas. We're in the path of the eclipse as well. A couple of hours away from total darkness. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully the world doesn't go crazy. Um, I'm excited about being a part of this historic event, but also uh, I don't want to be close to anything that would represent a, um, I don't know, a safe place for, for people to go crazy and freak out. I've seen the movie Apocalypto. I don't know what's going to happen beyond uh, the eclipse. Hopefully everyone keeps their, their minds about them. But before that happens, we're going to have a great conversation about pornography, sex addiction, uh, to conjoin twins, how that works in marriage. And I'm excited to introduce my wife, first of all. Yes, hello. 26 years. Good news is, is we have plenty of toilet paper. Yes, we do have toilet paper. If there's anybody out there who makes a run of toilet paper during an eclipse, uh, I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm the first one that will vote you off the island. <laughs> uh, and then Mark Dennison, he's the special guest today. One of my, one of my favorite people that I've met cer certainly recently, but uh, every time I'm around him or talk to him, I feel like uh, I have hope for the world. There's, there's a general sense that we can solve big problems together when Mark Dennison's in the room. And he's got a wealth of, of knowledge, wisdom, experience, testimony. His ministry is powerful. He has been doing a great job of raising a flag that says, men, you, if you're out there, if you need help, if you're struggling with addiction, especially <laughs> sex addiction, pornography, there's hope, there's help, it's okay. You might be in a cycle of, of destruction, of shame, of guilt, uh, of not wanting to participate in this thing that's available to everyone, everywhere, all the time. And then you just feel like there's no hope, but he has uh, absolutely a ministry that's giving hope to, to many, many men out there for many, many years. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Brent. Glad to be here. Coming in from Florida. Yes. And you are also an avid Eclipse uh, watching fan. You're ready to throw on the glasses. I was going to be here anyway. You know, I've got my glasses. I'm ready to go. I'm not saying the world's going to end, but I didn't book a flight back, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. You know, flying up in the air with Jesus, you know, I don't know what that's... Yeah. Maybe you can maybe stop by and get some, something from your house. Maybe they'll let you stop by there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of things happening in the world. I think people can talk about um, you know, the, the world, the madness, all the events going on. It is something, obviously, that you know my father, who uh, is big into Bible prophecy, would, would say we are living in the end of the end times. Um, I have a hard time arguing with that notion because of all the things happening in the world. So we, we definitely want to live like Jesus coming back today, yeah. but expect him to wait another hundred years. So we live our lives and, and um, tell people about the good news of Jesus. And also the, this, this idea, this topic that we're talking about, in the world that we're in right now, the prevalence of pornography, uh, it just cannot be understated. And it is available to young kids now because of smartphones. The statistics are gruesome. They're not fun to talk about. They're, they're, not, they're not fun to talk about because essentially, if you look at the stats, pretty much they point to everybody. At some point in their life is looking at it, has looked at it, will look at it. And I, I, as a man, I understand it. The, the, the wild, wild west of the internet back in the day um, was something that I was introduced to pornography in a way that I'd never been introduced to before because in the 80s, when I grew up in 90s, HBO, you might, you might have got a glimpse of, you know. Skin of Max. Yeah, there might have been a, a bikini uh, show on the, the late night channels yeah. that showed a little uh, more skin. And then, you know. In, in college, I remember there was satellite now that you could have access to certain shows. And it was one of those things where I just felt like it was very difficult to watch it. It was extremely uncomfortable to have to get access to it. As opposed to, I mean, like even the Playboys, that if you went to a 7-Eleven or whatever it is, you would have to request it. And there was another human being watching you do it. Um, now it's just, there's there's just no sense that there's barriers or even shame associated with it. Our society kind of condones it. The pornography industry is massively well-funded. Um, and then, you know, we have kids now that, that we're, we're caring about, and how do we give them a sense that we can solve this problem? And if they ever get in contact with that, you know, world, to have the strength to stand up against it or to be able to resolve it quickly to not get addicted to it because it's highly addictive it's a highly addictive form of, of of you know sexual interaction so i'd like for you just to introduce yourself you've got some you've written 11 books you're very well uh, accomplished you know expert on the subject just start with 
kind of what you see, uh, your little bit of your testimony too, and let's start going down the rabbit trail of finding some, some spots maybe that we can plant our flag together in the ground and say, we're going to stand together and really believe that the future we can, we can um, help people escape from the, from the reality that, that porn is prevalent. So go ahead and take over. Sure. Well, first, thank you all both for having mm -hmm. me. Really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, one of our great concerns is that pornography is destroying marriage. And obviously that's why God called XO into existence was to equip husbands and wives to do marriage God's way. And you cannot do that with the prevalence of pornography within the, the marriage bed. And we know the statistics, and I've written books on this, but just recent data shows us that the divorce rate among couples that introduce porn into their marriage is four times higher than mm. those who never do. And when a guy says to me, and I hear this all the time, I'm just looking at porn, chances are 370% higher that one time looking at porn, he will go to an actual woman outside of marriage. Mm. And so we know it's progressive, and we've got to attack it early. And I wish I had done that in my own life. I was raised in a Christian home in Houston, or a church home, although we didn't go a lot. But we were Christian in the sense that we honor God in our home, but beyond that, not much. And so it was through a bus ministry that I got active in church. Bus came to our apartments, invited me to ride the bus. Mm -hmm. My brother and I got on the bus. We went to church, and that's really where we came to Christ. And whenever we talked in the 70s about pornography, we were just shut down. We don't go there. It's a sin to even talk about it. Mm -hmm. So we had to explore our sexuality and privacy, secrecy. Secrets are worse than pornography. Mm -hmm. Pornography cripples, but secrets kill. I became a sex addict in my late teens, early 20s. And I fought this in my own life, but I did it alone because who could I tell? I couldn't tell church leaders. I was a pastor by the time I was 24. Couldn't tell anybody in that world. And so I just was on an island trying to get a handle on this. And I was discovered by my wife 30 years later. Over a period of 30 years, I never had a month where I was completely clean. As I sit here today, it's been over nine years. And so it, it, it didn't come easy, but part of that was digging into my past, recognizing, as with all guys that are addicted to this, that I had three things in my life. I had trauma. I was sexually abused as a child, physically abused as well. I had uh, several forms of isolation. I had some handicaps as a child, couldn't walk normally, stuttered, was legally blind, and also had abuse. Mm -hmm. And you put those together, maybe we'll talk about this later, that's the foundation of what I call the addiction pyramid. It begins there, and that's where it began for me. So I began looking for things in all the wrong places. And so for me, pornography, sexual addiction was not a bad problem, it's a bad solution. Mm -hmm. It's what we turn to because there's an intimacy disorder, there's something else that is wrong. And if we only address the issue of porn, we never get to the heart of the problem. It took me years to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the story is not uncommon. I mean, I think that men are, are wired a certain way. Yeah. Now, your story of trauma and your story <laughs> of having, you know, some maybe deficiencies in a worldview that would allow you to kind of maybe lean towards, you know, uh, needing that coping mechanism, uh, needing something to kind of give you a sense of humanity and, you know, connection point. Um, but, but most men just, just naturally are prone to have a lustful eye, to, to see a woman and immediately think a thought or have a desire to connect with them sexually. We're very visual. Highly yeah. visual. And, and I would say that sex can sometimes be, you know, for me at least, you know, uh, brought into the equation of, you know, there's, there's oxygen and food and water and sex sort of all in the mix. So going to eat a meal going to have sex is sort of like this, this uh, hunter mentality, you know, I just kind of want to get this thing, this, this need I have met, um, and pornography is the quickest way to get that need met, so I don't have to interact with another human, I can get that need met in theory, but it's so, it's such a false sense of satisfaction. The, the cycle I see guys get into is they don't want to do it. They're tempted, they do do it, 
because they fall into that trap, then they feel guilty again. It's just a cycle over and over again. It's like they can't. Can, can I respond to that? It's like a dog quick? returned to his vomit, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you say that, I thought, boy, you have done your research. That's exactly right. There's a cycle I teach guys all the time. There's six parts to it. I think it, I plan it, I do it, I hate it, I cover it, and then I go do it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I did what every guy does. 99% of Christian men have looked at pornography. Mm -hmm. We think it first. What I do tomorrow is based on what I think today. I don't ever do anything I don't think first. So I think it, I plan it, I do it, then I hate it, I repent, I'll never do this again, I cover it, which isolates me, and then I go do it again. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So what, I have a question, what, what was it, why did you choose or turn to pornography versus drugs, alcohol? I mean, was there something that you were exposed to that started you know, that? Sexual addiction for me, I think the genesis was exactly what you just said, something I was exposed to as a child. And that was sexual abuse at the hands of a neighbor. It was a one-time thing. But also, um, the problem with drugs <laughs> is when you're 14, 15, 17, 18, and then as a pastor, that's harder to access. Mm -hmm. Pornography or sexual addiction is not. Mm -hmm. The hour of the day, there's 24 hours in a day, the hour of the day that guys act out sexually more than any other hour is 2 a.m., because we have our phone, we're in bed, we're, we got our phone. The average guy looks at his phone 357 times a day. Mm -hmm. He wakes up at two in the morning, it's there, it's convenient, it's easy, no one catches you. Mm -hmm. More people look at one porn site in a day than watch the Super Bowl last year. Mm -hmm. More people look at that one porn site in a day than read Playboy the entire first year that it was in existence, oh. which is why it's not in existence anymore. The internet buried it. And so for me, and I think for most guys, it is accessible. Mm -hmm. And the reason that every drug addict who's also a sex addict, and 60% of sex addicts have a dual addiction, it's usually a substance abuse issue, and there's 166 addictions according to the APA, they, they go to the other addictions because even the sex addiction doesn't do it for them, so they move to something else. But invariably, they will always say, this is the hardest one to beat. I will never be an alcoholic, and the reason for that is I've never drank alcohol. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but you don't become an alcoholic if you never drink. Mm -hmm. God did not give me a desire for alcohol. My dad gave me a sip of beer when I was 14. My spleen is still sitting on the floor that, before that <laughs> happened because it tasted horrible to me. Mm -hmm. I, there's not a natural drive for alcohol mm -hmm. or drugs, but there is for lust. And so sex is a desire God put in every one of us. Mm -hmm. So he takes away the addiction, but he doesn't take away the desire. Mm -hmm. And so I was born with that, and so I didn't have to go looking for it. That's the way I'm wired naturally. So I think that's the answer, Stephanie, is it was, it was a God-given um, desire that every man has, and it was accessible, mm -hmm. and I could do it in secrecy. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing is secrecy. Mm -hmm. Not just with the biblical, obvious, the biblical standards that we all want in our lives, that it, it's taboo biblically to, to you know, interact with pornography or obviously have sex outside your marriage. But just in terms of pornography and the practical science of it, there is, there is a large <clears throat> bit of data out there that, that studies have shown men who interact with pornography typically struggle to be successful in all their other areas of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're wasting uh, your, you know, your, your semen, your sperm, and your, your energy on, you know, these images that aren't satisfying you in any way, shape, or form. Um, so practically speaking, just in, in terms of men out there or women out there that are struggling with pornography, they don't really want to do it, but they need kind of that kick in the butt to kind of get them to sort of wake up and realize other areas of their life are affected negatively by interacting with pornography. Yes. How, how would you speak to that? Yeah, in fact, I've been reading recently a lot of just uh, there are studies coming out. It's a brand new discussion that, that we're having in the corporate world. We know that guys are looking at porn on their computer at work for one to two hours a day. Yeah. And so what corporate America is starting to wake up to is that they're noticing not only is that a time distraction, but they've used up, they fired all their bullets looking at, at pornography on the computer. And so the rest of the day, they're worthless also. Mm -hmm. And so they're wanting to shut this down. I have a lot of guys I'm working with right now that are telling me that their companies have shut down pornography on their computer, put blocks on there. They don't care about the morality of it. They've even said, look at it at home all you want to. Just don't do it here because 
the guys that do it are not as good in the time in the hours that they're not even doing it. They're doing. Are they gratifying themselves on the job, like yes. somewhere in the bathroom, or yeah. what? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, the other hour that people act out is 2 p.m. It's 2 a.m., 2 p.m. Huh. 2 p.m., they're tired. It's the afternoon. The average worker today only works three hours a day. They say it's eight hours, but they're on the Internet. They're checking email, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. They're not really working. And so by the late afternoon, they dive into this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're, they find so many ways to do it, and, and the corporate world is starting to wake up to this fact. And they don't care morally. They just don't want to lose business. Mm -hmm. You know, I talked to my son about this. It's in sales and about how when COVID hit, it sent so many people from the workforce into their home. And now who knows what they're doing? They're not monitored. And so pornography just spiked even more. Mm -hmm. And the, it, it hurts their work on the job because they're actually looking at pornography. So, yeah, it has tremendous effects beyond the spiritual, beyond the relational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was during COVID, there was a lot of Zoom happening and that one journalist that was on a zoom call famously um yep was was didn't turn off his camera <laughs> and was walking over you saw him get his lotion and his box of kleenex and and the look on everyone's face that was on that zoom call was hey stop what you, hey you're <laughs> <laughs> trying to stop him but Probably in his life, that's a normal. That was he was. That can't not, be the I, only time he did. Yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. He was probably used to gratifying himself at two p.m. whatever time the call was. Yeah. And uh, we get we're creatures of habit. I just think that you know in that in that regard, if you're spending your time and your mind on pornography and you're wasting that energy there, as opposed to you know your health, your family, your your success in life. Um, I I empathize with men that fall into that trap once or twice because I know how easy it is to fall in that trap. Just as general rule of thumb, if guys are constantly looking at pornography, I tend to think that their mindset is one that's hindered by dumb stuff. Like just, they're not capable of realizing that, that doesn't lead anywhere. There's no, there's no sense of accomplishment in watching pornography every day. That just, to me, that just, it, it's, it's a bad, bad use of time. Uh, then you go to the spiritual side of it, and any time in my life that I ever had pornography, I had deep, deep, deep conviction afterwards. I mean, like, want to, you know, want to get rid of that feeling that I've grieved the Holy Spirit. I don't like that feeling, and so it's like a dog returns to his vomit. It's like, why would I keep doing something that makes me feel so bad? Temporarily, it feels great, but so bad afterwards that I was, I was just, and and God was just like. I'm not letting you off the hook. I mean, like, you, you can't, you can't, you know, at some point you can sear your conscience mm -hmm. and then you just get to a point where you're just oblivious. But again, that's the point where you're just going way down a slippery slope. Right. And I've got people in my life that have gone down a slippery slope. You can see it. They, their marriage is gone. Their family's gone. Their finances are gone. And they look back and they look, they go, what was this all for? That's what I'm saying. Just practically speaking and spiritually speaking, it's just a bad use of time. I understand the, the poison that it is that you're drinking and you don't realize it, but I'd also say that a lot of people do it every single day and they would tell you that their life is not affected by it. Yeah. Well, it's Romans 1. God gives them over to a reprobate mind. At some point, God says to each of us, if you want to live this way, I'll let you do it. You're going to pay a price for it. But when I work with guys, I, I have 150 men that are in nine different groups that I lead every week. And then I take guys to an intense 90-day program as well. And the first thing I tell them, because I feel compelled to do this, is that if you ever give me a hint that you're going to do self-harm, I have to report that. Because sometimes these guys are, become almost suicidal out of desperation. And this is the only thing that, that they hang on to is their porn habit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the only way they ever feel normal because the enemy has corrupted their mind so much and they're so far gone. That's what spurred the name of our ministry. My wife, we were sitting in a restaurant one time and several years ago, said, what should we call this? And she said, well, our marriage should have ended. I should have left you. And, and, and she said, I, I couldn't decide if I was going to leave you or kill you, and so I, hmm. I, in my indecision, you found redemption. But she decided there's still hope. And so that's what we're called, there's still hope. And that's the message I've got to give guys, is that you can have freedom. And you've got to get freedom because this doesn't end well. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen for you? 
Four things. Um, John chapter 5, I know y'all are familiar with the story of the paralytic, sick for 38 years. And I wish someone would have told me this. I had to figure this out for myself pretty much. And that was the, the first thing. It always starts with desperation. I wanted to be well, but I didn't want it badly enough. Uh, I've written a book, Recovery Rules. I've got 100 rules of recovery. Rule number one, I say this a million times a day. If you're 90% in, you're 100% out. A 90 is an A in school, so I've heard. I never did that, but it's an A in school. But in recovery, it's an F minus. I had to be desperate. Jesus looked at this guy in John 5, 6, and he said, you want to be well? And the, the word want in the original language was one of desperation. Or do you really, really want it? So I had to be desperate. I had to be at my rock bottom. I'm going to lose everything. I was desperate. Number two, there has to be surrender. Jesus said to this guy, and you think about it, it's kind of a funny thing he said. He said, pick up your mat and then walk. Well, at the end of the story, we know the guy used to be able to walk, <clears throat> and Jesus made that clear. But at this point, he hadn't walked in 38 years, and Jesus said, pick up your mat and then walk. He didn't say, once you're able to walk, pick up your mat. He was calling him to surrender until we do the improbable, God does not do the impossible. Mm -hmm. So I had to be surrendered and say, God, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. If that means tell my story, if that means a therapist, whatever it takes. Third thing is disclosure. Someone's got to know our stuff. And I hadn't told anybody. I kept a secret for 30 years. Nobody, nobody, nobody knew. And so this man noticed Jesus did not heal him at his house that morning. He could have, but he waited till he was in front of a crowd. And so I've got to, someone has to know my story. And so I had to tell somebody, and I did. And the last thing is connection. Mm -hmm. Jesus does and heals in isolation. The man was in church that night in John chapter 5, so I need a connection. We all need connection. I go to two recovery groups every week myself for my own recovery because I believe that, that, that recovery and sobriety is a choice more than a condition. I've got to choose every single day. Mm -hmm. And that desperation has to remain there. Uh, I've had two friends that have relapsed after 10 and 20 years. Mm. I don't want to be that guy. Mm -hmm. What happened? They were no longer desperate. And I've got to want this. I call addiction my best friend because that drives me into surrender like nothing else. I almost feel bad for someone who doesn't have an addiction mm -hmm. because they've got to find another way to stay surrendered. For me, I know that if I'm not completely surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, I don't have a chance. Mm -hmm. And so that keeps me in a place where God wants me to be all along. So those are the four things I think work for everybody. I've got to be desperate, surrendered. Someone has to know, and there has to be connection. The opposite of addiction is connection. So a couple questions I have for you. Um, number one, I don't feel like in most cases, as a, as a guy, if he struggles with pornography in a temporary fashion, mm -hmm. that that's grounds for divorce. I also don't feel like the, the, the wife is a safe place to process that struggle. How, how would you process that? Well, we don't make recommendations on the divorce issue because we think that, when I say we, I'm talking about my wife and I, that to engage in cyber sex is an affair. You do, you do feel like that? I do. Um, because if I say it's not... Am I giving myself permission to do that? <clears throat> if I do it once or twice, is that okay? If it, if it is, what's not? Is it five? Is it 10? Is it 100? I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just talking about um, the severity level in, sure. in a marriage context, the gravity on... on sure. I mean, for, for a man, for example, again, you know, eating a BLT for lunch and looking at pornography can sometimes be... I mean, like they, they don't see it as I'm cheating. They see mm -hmm. it as I'm satisfying this, this right. hunger I have right. for something. Right. Um, for a wife, obviously, she would see it as cyber sex and, and, and going outside the, the, the marriage. But it's, it's so prevalent that I just give guys a little bit of grace. I'm not giving them a free pass. I don't want that out there. I'm not saying that I believe it's okay for them to see it. I'm just saying it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if you stumble on it and you, in a short season... Kind of, kind of get in a, in a ditch, and then your wife says, "Well, you looked at pornography. I want a divorce." Yeah. I just, I just like to pump the brakes and figure out if this is a, a something where, um, he's chronically doing it against her wishes. <clears throat> sure. Or if, if he just needs some help from a pastor or a friend, 
And through that help and accountability, she can know, the, yeah. the spouse can know that this is going to be okay, that it's, that it's no different than, you know, a, a wife, a woman having emotional ties with somebody through social media. That happens all the time where there's conversations, whether it's in comments section in front of everyone or DMs or whatever. If I went into her DMs and she had had interactions with another man um, and the interactions were playful and not sexual, I would feel violated, but I wouldn't feel like it's grounds for divorce. And so I just feel like those are kind of apples and apples, but you might think they're apples and oranges. And I, th I think that's fair to talk about it. Well, yeah. Um, I think a better question would be, what does God recommend? Not what does God allow? Because God never recommends divorce, period. And so my wife, when she's dealing with a woman, and from the woman's perspective, they usually take a different view than men do on that. And they will tend to say, if my husband is looking at pornography, I see that as an affair, therefore I have grounds for divorce. We don't argue that point. We don't get into that discussion. We say it's between you and God. But having said that, in the name of our ministry is there's still hope. So whether it's happened once or twice or it's chronic, there's hope. God wants to see reconciliation every time. Uh, doesn't mean it's going to happen. We know God allows for divorce in some cases, but it doesn't mean that he recommends it. But, but obviously, um, you're right. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult question because, again, where do you draw the line? But, I mean, some women would rather their husband have one affair one night with a guy than look at porn every day for a year. Uh, but still, we know that God wants to heal. God can heal. God can redeem. That's what God wants to do. And that's the greater testimony. If every woman divorced every man who ever looked at pornography, we wouldn't have babies. Right. Or if we did, they'd be out of wedlock. Yeah. Because we know that 99% of men have looked at porn. And the ones who haven't can't have kids anymore because they're 90 years old. Mm -hmm. And they just never, you know. So, uh, you know, to your point, I think if you want to get technical about it, that's one answer. But if you're going to introduce grace, that's another answer. And you've got to allow for the Holy Spirit to do a work in our life of redemption and forgiveness. Because that woman, my wife will tell the woman, you've got issues also. You know, and, and we get into lust. What does she say about lust? Lust is divorce. And, or lust is the same thing as an affair. Hmm. Um, Sexaholics Anonymous, which is not a Christ-centered group, but they have an interesting definition of sobriety. They call it victorious living or progressive victory is the way they say it, over lust. Not over the acting out. So if you want to go that far, you could say, should every man be divorced if he lusted after a woman? Well, all of us have done that. So we don't get into what God may want that couple to do other than to preach hope and redemption. Yeah, I just want to be practical in our messaging for young, especially young couples out there, because I think sure. that's where it falls into. As, as you get older and as men become more seasoned and their desires, you know, obviously can kind of take over their lives mm -hmm. in a more severe way, I think there is probably a conversation of, is this something that he's going to change? And if he's not willing to change and stop looking at it, I definitely think a woman has to protect herself and her family at some point yes. from the devastation of, of pornography. I'm talking about young couples I've seen where, you know, it is a struggle. Kids now are being brought up with access to it, and that, they get married, and their wife feels violated, and her first, you know, line of defense is, is the divorce route. You know, I didn't realize I married a sex addict, and I went out of this marriage. And I just like to encourage young couples out there to, you know, take a step back and just analyze the, the, this dynamic between men and women, and is he willing to get help and accountability, and is this a, a process where you can walk through it? Your marriage will be stronger after the end of it, I can promise you that. Now, yeah. physical affairs are devastating. <clears throat> they're, they're very devastating. I, I just don't see them as one-to-one. -one. I don't see a, a guy looking at a porn site um, and a guy going and being physically with a woman as the same thing. So I just want to, I just want to temper people sometimes to not use both, you know, um, punishments to fit the same kind of, it's not the same crime in my opinion. It is a crime. It, but but it you're right. Different sins have different consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. And, and, and for marriages, I just want them to kind of be able to process things in a healthy way whenever they're overwhelmed with this sense of, because the guy feels ashamed and then the, the, the wife feels angry. And, you know, there's this sense of, like, betrayal and, and mistrust and those kinds of things. And you have to build that trust back as a guy. But uh, you're never going to get a guy to change his behavior by making him feel terrible about what he's just done. He's going he's gonna to already feel bad. So I'm just saying uh, be, be available to get him help. Uh, be willing 
to see him get help and know that that's going to be better for your relationship as opposed to separating and divorcing because he's had a struggle in this area. Now, the, my other question to you was, should he go to his wife for the struggle or should he go to someone else? Both, but to someone else first. Um, one of the things I have my clients do is they make a, an agreement. It's 24-24. If there's a relapse, if there's a slip, they look at porn, they masturbate, whatever it is. They tell me within 24 minutes, they tell their wife within 24 hours, meaning they get wise counsel first. But women are just so wired for honesty mm -hmm. that they have got to, got to, got to know um, that where they stand with their husband. Men don't get that because we want to say whatever's going to put us in the best light for the next 10 minutes. But for women, honesty trumps everything. So mm -hmm. they've got to know. We, we facilitate disclosures. We use polygraphs. And a lot of people don't like that because they say, "Can't you should just trust me. That's what first Who are you Corinthians, giving polygraphs to? To the man. And um, in your groups? Uh, it's one-on-one -on -one when they do a disclosure. If the man does a disclosure to his wife where she, he writes out his entire story, and she wants to know that she really knows everything, mm -hmm. they then go take a polygraph where they ask some questions with someone who's trained in this area, polygraphers, uh, so she can be certain that she knows everything, that he's really being honest. Um, but, yeah, it, women, they, they just, honesty matters so much to them that, mm -hmm. that we think it's best if the wife does know, unless she has said up front, I don't want to. So she gets to decide. We have some women who say, I don't want to know everything. If you're looking at porn, I don't want to know that. That's fine. She can make that decision. But it needs to be her decision as to whether he tells her what his struggles are. And what if a wife doesn't care and she, <laughs> she says to her husband, I don't care if you look at porn, you can look at porn, just don't cheat on me physically. What if she's giving him permission to, to look at porn? Because that's sure. not uncommon these days. Yeah, and, and in America, we, we don't realize what's going on in the rest of the world. In Europe, in the church... That happens all the time. Exactly. And you've got topless women, images on the buses, on the side of the bus, it's on billboards, it's just expected within the church. You will rarely hear someone say in England or Norway and Sweden that this is wrong, even in the church. So our view on that is then it becomes between the man and his God. If, it's, if the woman says, I don't care, I'm going to step away from that, then he has to decide between me and God. But I argue a man's not really sober. Um, if, if, his, if he cannot stay sober alone, he's not really sober. So I need to be sober for me, whether my wife's a part of the equation or not. You know, and, and that's because of all the damage that it does to me, the lust, everything involved in that. Uh, so, yeah, but until uh, other than that, we think the wife needs to know what she thinks she needs to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that, you know, in this day and age, it's just... <laughs> The shame factor of it is yeah. not there as much because I hear about couples that they watch it together in their marriage. Sure. They think that it's something that you should bring in to kind of spice things up, right. especially if you're going through a lull or, yeah. you know, you've been together yeah. for a long time. The answer is, well, let's try porn. Let's watch mm -hmm. porn. Do you find that a lot? In yeah. yeah. When my wife and I were struggling years ago, we found a Christian, so-called Christian therapist is exactly what he said. He said, y'all watch enough porn together? <laughs> and my wife said, excuse me? He said, well, maybe you're not watching enough porn. And I'm thinking, I like this guy. Yeah. You know, where, why didn't we find this guy? So my wife said, did you put him up to that? Do you know this guy? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's becoming pretty common and dangerous as it can be, mm -hmm. you know, because it creates so much body shame, body image issues for the wife when she's looking at this really fake image mm -hmm. of what, she's supposed to look like what sex is supposed to look like but yeah it's become so common and and, and i'm glad you mentioned the word shame shame such a horrible thing such mm -hmm. a horrible force we don't want guys to ever live in shame mm -hmm. we want them to live in guilt that's the holy spirit saying you did something wrong shame is the enemy saying you're just a wrong person mm -hmm. guilt says i messed up shame says god messed up he made me this way mm -hmm. i'll blame him i can't help it i'm just this kind of person mm -hmm. and they just live in that shame and they never get well mm -hmm. such a it's such a um, natural part of, of society to have this I mean, it's, it's thousands of years of you know a man lusting after a woman and obviously the proverbs talk about the fire and the and the and the woman, the harlot, you see is some woman that's out there, she looks sexual and you want that and it's like taking fire into your own 
yeah. uh, chest and you know you get burned. There's no there's no amount of it that don't, doesn't get on you, but it is really difficult psychologically sometimes whenever you have a world where women struggle with it just as much as men. Um, maybe not to the same degree st statistically. Well, I would say though, I, I th that's that's what I'm trying to say is that there is this new generation of women and a message that's coming out or that is already out is just being in touch with your own body, your own sexuality, you finding pleasure. And it's um, about just, it's not necessarily about him anymore, the man looking at, you know, pornography or anything like that. It's it's about women doing it. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like women yeah. are more and more. Yeah, in, in fact, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times we find that when the woman doesn't want the guy to be accountable, it's because she has the same problem mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to be held accountable. We know that among all sex addicts under the age of 30, 40% of them are women. When you get to people my age, I'm 40 now, from uh, <laughs> on up, I mean, I'm 64, it's almost all men. Uh, and part of that, it's really not almost all men, but women feel so much more shame. So they don't, they're the last to admit it. But in the younger generation, absolutely, it's, it's almost 50-50 now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's just a growing problem. It's, it's huge. And, and, and it goes all the way down to adolescence. We, the, the last good study showed that age 11 was the average age that people start looking at porn. It's probably nine now. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke at a Christian junior high school a couple of years ago, about 100 students. I said, close your eyes. No one's looking. I made all the teachers leave the room. I said, now raise your hand. No one's going to see you but me. I felt like an evangelist. <laughs> and I want to know how many of you have looked at porn. Age 11 are these kids and 12. Every single hand went up, including the girls. Mm -hmm. All 100 of them had. 100%. And I think it, go, it speaks to the accessibility that you talk about. Totally. Well, and there's, there's so many parts of this whole you know, mess of pornography is that, you know, there's, there's people on the other side of the lens that are performing all of this stuff. And oftentimes they are, you know, uh, doing it because they need the money or they're being sex trafficked or there's just this, uh, like, lifestyle that they've been brought up in that, that is forcing this this behavior that they don't necessarily want, but it's kind of the only thing they know. And by making a commodity out of this whole thing, you're just you're just building a really, really dangerous cesspool of, you know, um, an industry that needs people to perform a certain way. It gets weird and weird, weirder and weirder as, you know, you kind of get down into the, the trail of pornography. I mean, there's, there's a lot of awkward and weird stuff out there that, that people, I guess, want, or else they wouldn't have, um, pornography made that way, mm -hmm. you know, people dressing up as certain things, you know, wearing costumes and then all the sorts of, you know, uh, fetishes that people have. And, and then of course there's gotta be people that perform these kinds of things. And now with only fans, you got people making millions and millions of dollars yeah, by, yeah. by selling yeah. access to their body. Um, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know that I understand where there's ever a, a point where even if you, from a policy side and a legal side, put in parameters, which it's never going to happen because most of the people that make those laws don't want that kind of standard put on their own lives because right. they, they probably view it. So I'm just saying, like, I, my personal <laughs> opinion is I don't know how to solve that problem ever because it's a thousand-year-old problem, thousands and thousands. It's from the origin of time. And yet we want to protect our young kids and children. So... Tell me what the answer is. <laughs> Solve the problem right now, right before the eclipse happens. The answer is dad leaving at home with his kids and not leaving his family. Amen. Being a man. I mean, that is the answer. Uh, we know that, in, and this is going to sound pretty controversial, but studies seem to show that very rigid, fundamental Christian and other religions that are very legalistic tend to struggle with this more than anybody. They've got all these rules. And I won't name the groups, but you can imagine how I might be thinking of tons of rules within their religion, many under the broad tent of Christianity, that would say, don't do this. It's wrong, 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 sinful. Got all these rules, and they struggle more than anybody. Uh, so we know that's not the answer, to your point. The answer is men have to be at home. The dad has to be there to say to the 11-year-old son, to the 10-year-old son, to the 12-year-old son, son, I've been there. I've had struggles. I know what this is like. I'm still here. I'm working on me. I want to help you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if the dad is not in the home, it's like everything else. 
the kid's got no chance. If dad's not going to be a man, if he's not going to stay at home and be the dad and the husband that God intends him to be, not that he's perfect, it's almost impossible for the kid to escape. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's going to be scathed. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a genius on the subject and you're very much an, an expert. You've got 11 books. Uh, Recovery Rules is one of them. You mentioned this before. Um, it's a very easy read, and it's got something that you could pull up in your uh, you know, life I don't know if you have this on audiobook either or digitally. Working on it. Um, but it's something that you could just kind of, like rule number 30, rule number 43. I mean, it's the very, these things are very short. It's like one or two pages that gives you uh, something that you could read for that day. You could just focus on rule number 43 that day and just give your mind something to take it off of, you know, the, the, the temptation, the struggle that you might be having, the, the, the chronic, um, I don't know, just cycle that you're in, uh, that yeah. most guys can get in. And, and guys are really good about doing it, being sneaky, getting away mm -hmm. with it. Seven and I have access to each other's phones. She has access to my computers. Most of, if not all of our screens are like in places where it would be very difficult to look at something. Um, and we're always around each other. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, there's very limited time and opportunity to do anything. Now, you can do anything anytime you want to by just manipulating the process. I'm saying that. Uh, but if you can, as a guy out there, if you can get yourself in a place where you are accountable, you are willing to be honest and give your wife access to anything, um, you're not trying to hide something from her that she doesn't even have an ability to ask a question or yeah. she doesn't know exists. Some guys yeah. have, I mean, uh, there's been stories even in the church of guys having alternate identities and, and using fake licenses and, and fake stories and sure. they travel and they would tell women they're businessmen and they would have affairs and very, very dangerous. I think those kind of guys are just looking. Sometimes I believe pastors who are burnt out are say, saying to themselves, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out my way. Mm -hmm. And they, and they go have affairs because they simply are burnt out and they don't care anymore. And they'd rather go out having some fun than, than, you know, than not. 37% so, of pastors are looking at porn every week. Hmm. And we tell women all the time, your point about accountability, that guys do what you inspect, not what you expect. And so being on covenant eyes or accountable to use some of these uh, screening devices, technology is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, men have got to be accountable to somebody. Mm -hmm. And when there's a breakdown of accountability, we don't recommend the wife be the person who has to monitor him all the time but someone needs to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's like Jesus. He had certain numbers in his life. He had five numbers. He had one, three, 12, one, 20, and 5,000. Most men have the one, they have the 12, the five, the one, 20, and the 5,000. We have the one, that's God. Three is Peter, James, and John. Jesus took them to places nobody else went. Mount of Transfiguration, raising of Jairus from the dead, Garden of Gethsemane. You have the 12, the small group, the disciples. You have the 120, the church, 5,000 is the community. But it's those three. That's where most men struggle. It's to say, I need those three guys mm -hmm. that can inspect my life. They can look at my phone anytime they want to. They can ask the hard questions. Because we tend to do what people inspect, not what people expect. That's good. I have a really difficult question for you. What do you think about sleep divorce? <laughs> Explain that for people watching. Yeah, so this is a not just a growing trend. There are people out there mm -hmm. like Barbara Corcoran. She's the, uh, did I say her Shark last name King. right? Um, Barbara Corcoran. I'd have to see like it. That. I don't know. She's the Shark Tank lady. She's she's brilliant on the Shark Tank show. Mm -hmm. She does really good, good. So her and her husband sleep in separate bedrooms to keep the sexiness alive in their 35-year marriage. I would say that um, in, in the context of, you know, people, you know, having their own lives and being able to kind of do whatever they want to do, uh, there are people that would say that that's the secret to success in their relationship is having separate sleep, yes. uh, separate bedrooms, um, the, there's, there's homes that I sent a Wall Street Journal article to Stephanie, uh, recently that there's, there's homes being built that are specifically designed for the, the homeowners to have separate bedrooms, separate bathrooms and living styles. I, I would say that my, my mom's parents, they did this specifically. They have a house they built and, um, they did it because my grandfather would snore and my grandfather couldn't stand it. And so they would. They would sleep separately. For most of my childhood, I mean, really since I can remember, my grandfather never slept in the same room as my grandmother. And they would be together. They'd hang out together in the bedroom. And then once it came time to go to, go to bed, 
he went his way. Ways. Right. He had his own bathroom. Sure. I, I saw that as normal <laughs> growing up. So for me, this isn't crazy. But for some people, it is crazy to think about this thing called sleep divorce, which is we are together until we go to sleep and then don't yeah. come near me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, y'all are younger than me, but um, do y'all ever see reruns of the Dick Van Dyke show? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I not beds. recently, but I know yeah. what you're talking about. Separate beds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the Bob Newhart show, if I'm remembering this right, which debuted, <clears throat> I'm going to say 1970 or so. I believe it was the first show that ever showed a husband and wife in bed together. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? You know, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've been making babies for some time now, so I'm <laughs> thinking this has been happening. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I think it's the, the clinical word I would use is that it's nuts. Um, <laughs> Because it's antithetical to God's picture of marriage, which is union and closeness and intimacy. And what I think is invariably going to happen is that the guy is going to turn for intimacy somewhere else if he's not in bed with his wife. But the the counter to that is that sleep is such a premium to mental health that if I'm not getting good sleep, (laughs) then I'm not a good spouse, Sure. ultimately. I'm not trying to justify it. I can just say, like, practically speaking, sometimes it does make sense. Now, we when we first got married, I mentioned to her, my grandparents, and said, wouldn't that be cool if at some point kind of I had my space, you had your space? And she kind of got emotional, tearful. She said, I didn't marry you to sleep separately from you. And now 26 years later, <laughs> the conversation's back on the table now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, um, you know, there's times where she wants to sleep, sure. and I'm either staying up, you know, and and tossing and turning, I sure. you know, can snore, whatever it is that normal human beings do, um, that yeah. it, it's not something we're interested in pursuing, but we can see the general concept being uh, permissible because it does encourage couples to sort of um, not get in each other's way when yeah. it comes to their, their mental state. Now, it's a very selfish thing, right? Because we have family members, the opposite is true of her grandparents, they slept in a full-size bed together, and her, her grandfather was, you know, a large man, and, and there, was, there was never a day that they wouldn't be together. And yeah. so that's, that's what your picture of true love is. But, you know. C- could I ask you a question? Absolutely. Let me flip the tables. Can you have me back on in 20 years? I want to see where this is. Because <laughs> I got yeah. a suspicion you're going to be there. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's probably good if it's an exception and not the rule. Mm-hmm. Um, once a week or so, I'm just making this up, I don't know, but once a week mm-hmm. or so, maybe it's better for the couple to have a little bit of separation. I'm away from my, my, my wife right now for four days. Mm-hmm. We're not recording this, are we? I love it. I think it's great, <laughs> you know, because I can do what I want to do in some ways. I'm, I'm not, don't have to be rigid to her schedule when you go to bed and that sort of thing. But that's an exception. It's not mm-hmm. a rule. Mm-hmm. And so I think as a rule, it's a horrible idea. Because intimacy is built from time together. We know mm-hmm. that it's quality, not quantity, that matters. And mm-hmm. so if you take away a third of the day that you're actually together and say, let's not do that now, then you're inviting all kinds of fantasy and lustful thoughts and other things, mm-hmm. and that becomes the norm. And if we're not together then, we, I would think we don't hold hands during the day. When we're walking down the street. We become strangers. It's got all kinds of bad written all over it. But as an exception, your back is sore. You sleep on the couch. You're watching a sporting event. Uh, you got some work to do. You stay up late. You don't want to feel shamed to go to bed early when your mind's really on work. I could see the advantage of that. Yeah. I, I had a I had heart surgery, a five bypass heart surgery, a little bit over a year ago, and I had to sleep alone for a while because I couldn't get in bed physically. I just wasn't able to get up and down. My wife bought me this recliner that old people have that lifts you up. <laughs> I used to make fun of it, and then I own one. And once <laughs> I could get up, thing. I sold it because I didn't want anyone <laughs> seeing it in my house. I uh, probably should have saved. I'll need it again at some point. <laughs> but there were advantages to that. But after a while, after a week or so, I'm like, I married this woman. Whether I'm touching her throughout the night isn't the point. Mm-hmm. I need her presence. Mm-hmm. She needs right. my presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would just say that she just Barbara just needs to go in there about 2 a.m. and make sure everything's okay. <laughs> He's <laughs> yeah. not on his phone. Exactly. But if Barbara's seeing this. Barbara, yeah. 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Yeah. Check on no, him. I have an investment <laughs> deal for you, first of all. Second of all, yes, we want to talk about your But she divorce. talks about in the article, one of the things that she says is that she sleeps with a um, she has sleep apnea and she needs a CPAP um, machine. And so she'll invite him in to her bedroom, you know, on occasion or, right. you know, I don't know how many times a week, but I am a believer in 
keeping a little bit of mystery in the marriage. Mm -hmm. I do think that that is healthy. You don't have to share and see every single thing about your spouse. I mean, I do like to, we know couples that, you know, they're going to the bathroom with the door open, just carrying on a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm not about Number that. Two. Number two. <laughs> <laughs> That's called laziness. Yes. And I'm just like, I don't really need to see every area no, of your life. No, so no. I am a proponent of keeping a little bit of mystery. I don't want separate bedrooms, but um, I can understand where she's, she's coming from. Yeah, and I think there's I think there's actually ways to do it. Where uh, younger couples, I would never want that to be a thing. As you get older, and you do have uh, particular habits that are, aren't conducive to intimacy. So, you know, there's we're gonna watch a video here in a minute. It, it talks about um, how cuddlers have better sex and have better marriages. But um, but this sense of to touching each other and, and connecting it has to be purposeful. If you're gonna have a situation like this, you have to be intentional about that physical intimacy time. Mm -hmm. What? That's I, I will tell you this. We, we did move at the advice of a lot of friends that were older than us. We have separate bathrooms now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought it was weird. Yeah. And now if we could only have two rooms in our, in our house, it would be the two bathrooms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it saved our marriage. It's great. Yes. Uh, there's just a lot of upside to that. But <laughs> when we moved from, from Texas to Florida, we didn't know if we were going to stay there. So we, we got an apartment for a couple of years, and it was not real big. And so we didn't have room for all my clothes in my wife's closet or our bedroom. So we had another bedroom, so I put my clothes there. And I couldn't fit all my stuff in one bathroom with her stuff, so I had two bathrooms. So I had a friend fly out to spend a couple of days with me, and we put him in the guest room. And I didn't think to tell him about this. And he sees my clothes are there, <laughs> the separate bathroom. He says, there's something we need to know here. Yeah. He said, are you all okay? I said, we're better than ever. And and so, well, I see all your stuff in the other bedroom. I said, no, I don't, I don't sleep in there ever, but I do bathroom over there. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I don't know if that's in the Bible. I think that's a but sign of intelligence. Good it is good. It's a sign of intelligence. <laughs> it yeah. really is. I mean, uh, obviously, <laughs> bathrooms are built now as master suites. And, you know, you've got these bathrooms that are, you know, you know two sinks and big showers, two headed shower things. Yeah. And it's great. But even like this morning, you know, when I'm getting in the shower, I'm considerate of her because the, the heat from the shower affects how she's doing her hair. And uh, there's just certain timing things that can happen with, you know, bathroom things. And then there's certain sounds and smells and all those kinds of things as well. I want the mystery as well. I don't want her <laughs> to hear everything I do uh, all the time, you know, when it comes to my body and reacting to certain things. And I got to say, we didn't go over this before we did the interview. I didn't know we were going to get into this, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, well, this is real talk. We, we go there. This, yeah, is, real this life. is real talk. This is a men's side y'all didn't I mean, before. this is wisdom for the young, young ones, you know? I mean, keep a little bit of mystery. Yeah, we went to Amarillo for Easter over the weekend, and Taco Villa is like the must. And, I mean, Taco Villa is one of those things where it's delicious, and then it's immediate regret, and then it's, uh, where's <laughs> it's, the closest it's bathroom? Not a I mean, it's probably on the same level as Taco Bell. It is. It's like it's like a it home is. hometown version of like a Taco Bell or those kinds of things. And so we, <laughs> she knows, like uh, I, there was no mystery. I mean, I had to go to the bathroom because of Taco <laughs> Bell, and that's 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 okay. That's, I think to some degree, like as a as a couple, you just know that there are certain things that affect your body. I'm talking about a daily basis. It's nice to kind of have zones where you can be yourself, um, where you don't always have to be so perfect because she's perfect but I'm not mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, that we can kind of keep that mystery happening so the other thing I wanted to watch was this uh, video clip from uh, an Instagram channel this is John Gottman but uh, let's play this real quick and I'll have you respond to it sure <clears throat> on cuddle only four percent of them said they had a great sex life 96 percent of the non-cuddlers had an awful sex life so touch is very important even physical touch even in public affection in public was a big thing and really you know that kind of connection the romantic date you know the romantic vacation that's what they did nothing involved kissing or what happened in the bedroom so none of that's there but there has been research on just kissing it turns out that not every culture do humans kiss but in the ones they do, kissing is very powerful, very erotic for most couples. And it's a nice gateway into eroticism. I found this really interesting study in your work where it said a 10-year German study that found that... Right. Said again. You, you can 
repeat this any better than I can. So. Men who kiss their wives goodbye when they leave for work live something like four years longer than men who don't. So, and that's a perfunctory <laughs> kiss. I mean, you know. <laughs> don't forget. <Steve. laughs> but the six second kiss, which we recommend, has much more potential than that peck on the sheep cheek. What is the six second kiss? A kiss that lasts at least six seconds. Why six not seconds five two. or four? Because two. oxytocin gets secreted with a 20 second hug or a six second kiss. You both secreting oxytocin. And that creates a sense of psychological safety and connection. And bonding. And bonding. What do you think about the subject of sex, Julie? Clark, How important it, it is for a relationship? This, uh, this, this question, but but that's an interesting kind of look. So Dr. John Gottman and his wife, they've, they've got the Gottman Institute. They do studies all over the place sure. and with lots of couples. <clears throat> so it's scientific in its approach, which I love that. And this idea that non-cuddlers have more sex than cuddlers and that's that's direct questions and this idea of physical touch and then the intentionality of, of kissing for six seconds not just a peck on the cheek but six seconds releases oxytocin um, and that has an effect on your relationship and your marriage and so I think that's a, a reason why in this sleep divorce you know season of some couples are in if you're not connecting physically if you don't have that physical touch you're setting yourself up for I, I would say that pornography outside intimacy from your marriage would be more prevalent if you're not intentionally touching your spouse and keeping that, that yep. oxytocin flowing between the two of you. Yeah. And, and we actually tried it this morning and six seconds, <clears throat> six seconds is a lot longer six than <laughs> six seconds. Six leads to sex. Yeah. I like it. Um, <laughs> it's actually longer than you think. I mean, we were standing there for a long time. Yeah, it's hard to do one Mississippi while you're kissing, but it was, <laughs> I was, I was in my head. I was like, did, did it just seem longer to you than yes. it did to him? No, no. Was it's just, it longer to you? It, no, I, I don't know. It just, because it was uh, me leaving before she did to come up to the office, um, we had just watched that video again. And so I, I, we were trying to, you know, like, try the six seconds. And first of all, if you just do this, like, put your lips together thing, that can be a little less romantic, just the, just sticking together. So you yeah. kind of have to put some motion into it. There's got to be a little bit of, yeah. you know, intentionality that, from it. What? Yeah, just the, the little peck that doesn't release o oxytocin. Oxytocin. There's got to be an intentionality to like, hey, I really want to kiss you. I really want to. But it's also hugs. So 20 second hugs, you really feel the bond um, when somebody's right next to you and their yeah. skin touching, whether it's cheek to cheek or just your arms around somebody. And I do feel like. As couples, you get busy and you don't you don't become intentional. And if studies are proving something, and that's an easy way for you to yeah. increase the intimacy in your relationship, I mean, try it out there because six seconds to sex <laughs> is going to be your uh, game plan today. And for, but for I think that's true though, because I think you know sometimes in marriage, and you've been longer married. How long have you been? been Forty married? years. Forty years. Sometimes it's just the little things that you forget that makes such a big difference. I mean, there's 41, forgive me, 41. <laughs> I mean, there's days when, you know, you just, you're in a rush and you don't kiss yeah. each other goodbye, but just those little things yeah. people just forget about that really just make such a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a study done years ago called his needs, her needs, William Harley. They interviewed, I think 20,000 couples and asked the men and the women, what your basic needs are and the five basic needs of the man, five basic needs of the woman. Number one for women was intimacy. The problem men have in sexual addiction is an intimacy disorder. And so men turn to other resources other than their wife because they're not intimate with their wife. We know the five love languages. It seems like a lot of women will say physical touch is their number one love language. My wife is one of those. And so the man who is not intimate with his wife, whether it's the hug or the kiss or emotional intimacy, he's going to turn to other places. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is not quit turning to other places. It's do this one right. Pour into your wife, and then that other desire will diminish mm -hmm. because you're getting the real thing. And, and the hug that doesn't necessarily lead, lead to sex is huge mm -hmm. because it brings about such a connection, which is why, for me, it seems odd to not at least be in the same bed together at night. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying, that, you know, that, that intimacy, the physical touch, whether it's a six-second sex or a kiss, <laughs> I can't say it either, or the 20-second hug, it's having touch. 
Mm-hmm. Huge. Uh, this brings me to it uh, real quick because uh, we got to wrap up here soon. Um, the, the eclipse is happening, everyone. We're about to experience the. <laughs> yeah. It's dark outside. I can't okay, even see Okay, but I do want to say I w- I'm I'm so into this oxytocin thing. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk about Oxycontin? this. Oxycontin. No, oxytocin. There's actually <laughs> there's different. actually I said that last different show. oxytocin. Mm, oxytocin. <laughs> there's actually new therapies being done with oxytocin. So we're going to talk about this in some yeah. We need to follow up on that. Ex- um, with episodes. with with the subject of sex and couples. And a wife is, uh, you know, she's experienced trauma in her past. She's not as comfortable doing certain sexual things. Not even crazy things, but just normal things that a a guy would find excitable. Um, And a guy gets frustrated because he needs his wife to kind of be at a level that he finds not, it's not weird, but he's just encouraging different positions or, you know, maybe, um, I'm not even talking about oral sex or other kinds of form of it, but that might even be on the table, like, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we can't even have conversations because she feels like it's weird. And this whole culture that, you know, especially in Christian culture that um, talks about sex is wrong, sex is wrong, sex is wrong. And then on your honeymoon night, it's supposed to be like wild, crazy sex. And then uh, a woman sees a penis for the first time. She's freaked out because she doesn't understand what it is and how it works and all this kind of stuff. And then you kind of get a guy, you know, who's wanting to explore sexually and his wife because of that trauma or because of that, um, that brainwashing or rewiring of sex is bad now has to figure out how sex is good, and the two of them struggle, and that's what kind of drives a guy to be tempted, not that he should, but I'm just saying like he's, he's wanting his wife to be more sexual, but she's kind of closed off, and how do you pick up on those signs where maybe that can be elevated to a therapist or a pastor or a counselor, and then at what point do couples start to find outside help for their sex issues that that cuz some guys will just feel like they're being shamed again for wanting something from their wife that she's not wanting to give and then she feels like he's pushing her out of, right. outside of her comfort zone and again I'm not th- talking about things that would harm her physically sure I'm just talking about you know uh, David Ashley do sex position <clears throat> like cards sure hey let's try these new sex positions you know I don't like that let's just get it over with you know I I just I'm happy to ple- meet your need but I don't want to give you like more than like what we normally do so the guy gets frustrated and ends up becoming, you know, just wanting to proceed with some level of, of, of getting, um, you know, not his needs met, but finding intimacy. Yeah. 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 Well, boy, there's a lot to unpack there just to be brief. Um, therapy, for sure, with the sex therapist. Uh, there's a reason for the reservations that either party may have that can be so deep-seated that you have to go back years and years and years and years to unearth that. And so the partner who's wanting more needs to understand that, that you don't want to traumatize this person. And they're coming from a wounded past, and they don't overcome that with one therapy session. Mm -hmm. And they don't overcome that with just a desire to please their mate. They may never overcome it, um, but they need to try, and there needs to be an effort to meet somewhere in the middle. At the same time, I say to guys all the time when they're frustrated that their wife is not comfortable sexually with them, and we know that usually a couple does not become comfortable for four years. It doesn't happen like in the movies. To imagine worst case scenario, your wife is in a horrific car accident. She's no longer able to be sexual with you. That doesn't give you a right to act out outside the marriage. Sex is not a need. Water is, oxygen is, air is, uh, food is. Those are three needs. You don't die without sex. If she's not able to, quote, perform the way that you would like for her to, that, that doesn't give you the right to turn somewhere else. But at the same time, she needs to try to be that person that you need for her to be or that you want her to be. Try to meet in the middle someplace, therapy, but understanding it may never be perfect. Mm-hmm. It rarely is. I mean, we're two imperfect people. And you put two imperfect people together, that doesn't equal perfection. So. Mm-hmm. It will be a struggle, but the struggle is part of the joy, trying to grow in intimacy through the struggle. We've talked for, I think, over an hour, but um, I could have you on again if you want to come on <laughs> the show again, and we, we, we definitely would want to have you on if well, you're willing. Well, I want to because I want to know where you all end up on this. Uh, <laughs> well, don't wait 20 years to come back on. I mean, that's what you're telling me. You'll be here back He's in 20 years. He's not getting his own room. I'm telling you that right now. Um, okay. No. So your website, um, the, the website is um, up on the screen. It's coming up on the screen. And I would like to uh, have you give an opportunity just to talk about uh, where people can find you, where they can find uh, your ministry, and anything else you want to say before we wrap up. There's still hope.org, and you can email me at mark at there's still hope.org. 
and uh, would love to help any of you that are struggling in this area. I work with men through a 90-day program. I take guys through nine different groups. I have a group just for doctors. I have a group just for pastors, another group just for pastors. And my wife works with spouses. We work with couples, uh, do speaking in churches, and a lot of other things. But we want people to know, no matter how hard it is for you, no matter how deep you've fallen, that there's still hope through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the grace of Jesus Christ. Reach out to us. We have academic background in this area. We have a lot of training, but we've also lived it. We know what God has done for us. He can do for anybody. Mm -hmm. There's still hope no matter what. We believe that or we wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, Terry Bradshaw endorsing you. Come on, man. That's a, that's a big deal. It is. Yeah, Terry's a good friend. I was his pastor for several years. Going to see him uh, in a couple of months. And um, good man. Yeah, no, I like him. He's he yeah. he seems like one of those kind of guys that was just raised right and has the has the common sense that we yeah. all need in our lives these yeah, days. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I want to say thanks again for coming on. And uh, again, your books are available online through your ministry website, and you've got eleven of them that can help. Uh, you can buy everything on Amazon as well. Okay, and you've got the two you brought me was the recovery rules and then porn in the pew. Uh, I do think that next time you're on, I'd like to talk about how maybe the church can can tackle this problem a little bit Love better. You. It's 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 messy because uh, pastors, again, if they're struggling, are going to have a hard time bringing this to light. But I would say more often than not, most men are wanting to get out of this lifestyle that they've they've been entrapped in, and they're they're just not wanting to give up any sort of um, ability to keep it sheltered and keep it kind of hidden in the in the storage. And, Brad, I want to thank you guys for addressing this subject because in the area of marriage, most people are just ignoring it. So mm -hmm. God bless you for doing this. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah thank it's, you. It's our, it's our pleasure. So if you're watching this out there and if you've enjoyed this show, I hope that you will take advantage of, of all Mark's uh, many resources. We love coming to you every week. And I, I hope also that you just take advantage of our mediation program that we have here. Steph and I just went through our mediation program to get certified. And I did so specifically, not so we can be part of the mediation team and do the mediations ourselves, but we can. We're certified. That's right. Uh, so we could uh, tell you more about the program and its impact. So counseling is for care, but mediation is for, for teaching and for training. And if you're in chronic need, if, you're, if your life is, uh, is built around a lot of chronic issues in your marriage that you want resolved permanently, um, this program has over 90% success rate of keeping people from divorcing. So divorce mediation is for people who want to get divorced. It has a very high success rate. Marriage mediation is for people that want to resolve their issues and stay married. And it also has a very high success rate if you're, if you're willing to go through the program. It is not for people in active addictions, abuse, or affairs. And so if you are out there and you've been watching this program and you're uh, hurting and your marriage is not yet at a place where you both can participate, uh, I would I would encourage you to find a program in your area that you can get connected with, or Mark's program specifically, especially for sex addiction. Uh, he's a great resource, and he's walked the he's walked the walk, not just talked the talk. And I think he's a he's a valuable uh, uh, man in the kingdom, and his and his marriage is obviously invaluable for so many couples out there. So connect with his ministry. Um, God bless you guys. I hope you uh, enjoy the eclipse today. And if you're watching this after the eclipse, and we're still here, um, go Cowboys. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> God bless you. Bye-bye.